مرحبا يا اخواني واخواتي انا دابر ديناصور okay back to english I am back for the final time to take a look at the lunacy of the Muslim Lantern and Sabor Ahmad as they try to debunk the theory of evolution by failing to understand even the most basic facts about it. We left off with them failing to understand even the most basic things about genetics, like what a mutation is, how genome comparisons work, what the difference is between terms like genetic code, gene, and even base pair. Now they are on the topic, rational problems with the theory. Let's see what these two dolts have for us. Now, we've done now with with this everything which i would call scientific i've demonstrated now what what did i do let's go back to the beginning what he did was show a profound ignorance of everything that he's talking about that rivals even roger from mud fossil use inability to comprehend anything he'd rather not accept what did i do i've demonstrated that whatever they call fossil record or evidence for evolution is in reality evidence against them what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. Right? So you've demonstrated the false record is actually evidence against evolution. Nope, it remains an aspect of the world that is only well explained by evolution and that only evolution can reliably make predictions about. We put forward the Cambrian explosion. Which poses no problem for evolution, no matter how much these two deliberately misunderstand it. We put forward how these species are, 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 are uh, actually evolving. He didn't. I did. It kind of blew his absurd nonsense out of the water. Uh, in, in very quick periods, and how it's impossible for it to happen. The Cambrian lasted some 50 million years. It's more than enough time for the observed evolution in the Cambrian. On a long period, uh, sorry, if it's not on a long period of time, it's impossible. And 50 million years is a long time. And how the Cambrian explosion completely refutes this idea. It completely refutes this idea the same way that the Quran refutes Tawheed. I put forward all of the fabricate, not all, by the way, that I can go on and on, by the way. Oh, just some 13 only links of some of the fabrications that they put forward. Actually, he put forward exactly one fabrication that was accepted by anyone in the scientific community, Piltdown Man. All his other examples were misidentifications, except for Archaeoraptor, which was a composite and rejected by all the paleontologists who looked at it. To, to try to support the, uh, the fossil record. Okay, so the... The fossil record doesn't need to be supported. It simply exists. And in the case of Archaeoraptor, it wasn't done to support anything, but to get some impoverished rural Chinese peasant a decent life more or less denied him by Winnie the Pooh over there. Oh, and in something real these two could be concerned about, rather than denying science... The Chinese Communist Party is currently enacting genocide against one of their traditionally Muslim ethnic groups, the Uyghur. And Disney filmed their shit Mulan remake in the province it's happening in and thanked the provincial government. Now, I'm not saying that Lantern and Sabor aren't concerned about that, just that talking about that could at least be a good use of their time, and instead they chose to lie to everyone about science. We move on from the false record. The seizure organs, we put forward how these are all lies. Actually, once again, they put forward that they didn't bother to even look up what a vestigial organ is, and instead pretended that any function for an organ means it's not vestigial, which has never been the actual definition. These organs, organs are not vestigial. How it's even circular reasoning that you don't even take that into consideration to begin with, because it assumes already evolution is true. In fact, you do not need to assume that evolution is true to show an organ is vestigial. Homology will do that just fine, and that does not rest on common ancestry. And when we say, why do you assume evolution is true, they will say to you the false record. Well, that and the twin nested hierarchy, successful predictions, ERVs, homology, etc. You go to the false record, they go to you to the stage along this. So you have to be very careful with these people, because they jump from one to another. So you, you refute all of them to make them very clear that, okay, there is no evidence for what you're calling evidence, right? People jump around when describing the evidence for evolution because it comes from so many places and is so ubiquitous throughout biology. Homology and blind naturalistic. We showed that homology is not evidence. Nope, he just pretended it required assumptions to detect that it manifestly does not because he has an anachronistic understanding of the concept as it was originally used. It's actually the opposite, as we showed with the, with the cichlid fish. We showed how natural selection is not blind. Maybe. I still don't know how I'm supposed to parse those words in the context he used them in. Natural selection certainly doesn't have actual physical eyes. But because it's environmentally dependent, it certainly can drive different populations in similar niches, in similar environments, to similar gross morphological traits. And it is guided, and they're not giving us an explanation how it is guided. No explanations were given. Lantern just pretended they weren't, even though he himself cited the sources in which they were. Right. We showed that there is no such thing as random mutations. No, what they showed was they don't understand the concept of randomness and think of it only as non-predictable but equiprobable outcomes. 
We should research from their magazines, from their own beliefs, how there's no such thing as, as a random mutation. Actually, what they showed is that not all mutations are equiprobable and that not all locations in a given genome have the same mutation rate, which is basically the same thing as saying that the outcome of rolling three six-sided dice isn't random since some results are more likely than others. We showed how similarities in genetic makeup is made up. No, they show that their understanding of genetics is about on the level of Kent Hovind's understanding of it, because they mixed up the terms genetic code, nucleotide, and gene, which all mean very different things. Okay, how similar this in genetic makeup is a concept that is made up. <laughs> so the question is now, why do I get certain people trying to say let's harmonize evolution and Islam? Because evolution is obviously and conclusively true, and either Islam is compatible with evolution, or it's not true. Bro, harmonize what? Deen al-Islam and evolution. What theory of evolution do you want to harmonize? Which one? Which, which, which type of evolution do you want to harmonize? There is only one theory of evolution, and if you want your religious claims to be compatible with reality, you'll harmonize it with all types of evolution. Like adaptive radiations, stabilizing selection, etc. This whole theory is a bunch of garbage that is put on top of each other. Lantern needs to save some of that copium for everyone else. If you have a, a trash can, why would I harmonize a trash can with Islam? Because if Islam is making you deny the existence of trash cans, that's a pretty good reason not to accept your version of Islam. And I want to, this is very important. What they try to take away is the acceptance in the heart of the believer. I promise, I don't want to take anyone's heart, even if I may be a heartbreaker. You know, before all of this nonsense of evolution, if we go to the 1800s and we go to a layman, and we say to him, look at the trees, look at the ants, look at these animals, how their evidence is for God. He just actually said, look at the trees. Holy shit, that's amazing. None of them would object. None of them would, they would say, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, all of these things are evidence that has to be a maker that guided them to do that. Yes, and if you went to lay people in Rome in the first century and told them that lightning was evidence of Jupiter and that storms are evidence of Neptune, they would have agreed with you. But, you know, Lantern wouldn't agree with that. The fact that ignorant people from the past would agree with Lantern's anti-science rhetoric is not a win for him. That's why Fir'aun, when, when he asked Musa alayhi salam, قَالَ مَا رَبُّكُمَا يَا مُوسَى Who's your Lord, O Moses? قَالَ رَبَّنَا الَّذِي أَعْطَى كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلْقَهُ ثُمَّ هَذَا Allah is the one who is given everything, its shape of creation, its creation, and then guided it. Allah is the one who is given everything, its shape, its creation, and then guided it. This is the Lord that we worship. Cool, but if that's not compatible with evolution, then it's not compatible with reality. And the Lord Lantern worships definitely doesn't exist in that case. If he wants to keep worshipping a lord, he'll need one that's compatible with observable reality. Why is evolution being put forward? Because it goes against this idea. Evolution isn't a conspiracy to disprove Islam. Most evolutionary biologists never think about the effects of their work on the theology of other people, and there are Muslim biologists out there. Evolutionary biologists, by and large, don't even know that there are still creationists on the fringes railing impotently against science, because they never do anything worthy of scientific attention. This natural innate thing in the human being to when he looks around, he knows there has to be a creator and maker for all of that, right? Maybe, but natural human intuition is notoriously unreliable. Human intuition tells us that the earth is flat, that heavy things fall faster than light things, and that there's no such thing as air. Turns out it took hundreds of thousands of years to fix those things, because careful logical investigation of the world does not come innately to humans. So what, what did we do today? We showed how this whatever rubbish nonsense that they're calling evidence it is not evidence for them, rather it is evidence for against them. And they have to explain to us who guided these mutations, uh, th these genetic uh, things that are, are not random mutations, who, how these mutations guided mutations, directed mutations happening. They're largely not. What is happening is that mutation rates and mutational hotspots are themselves evolvable. How this natural selection happening in different environments or organized, how it's happening. It's simple environmentally dependent differential reproductive success. It's honestly not very complex at all. If an organism has traits that make it better at making copies of itself than its conspecifics, then it's selected for and its alleles spread. Why the, 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 all of these species evolved quickly and not on a, a prolonged period of time? Nothing I'm aware of has evolved too fast for the theory of evolution to account for. It's young Earth creationists who need evolution to go at warp 10. Warp 10. How are they evolving and, not, and, and, and all of these changes are happening in the body and there is no one controlling them? You have to explain all of that and you have to give us an explanation. Lantern has been given explanations and in many cases use them as sources. But instead of taking those explanations on board, he simply lied about them. 
I do not think he is actually interested in explanations. He would rather be wrong than change his theology. He fundamentally does not care about truth. He only cares about his identity as a Muslim. Now, it is on them to ex explain the these things to us. Lantern and Sabor are manifestly not discussing this topic in good faith, so no one is obligated to explain anything to them. To reference another religion, explaining things to people who are being bad faith interlocutors is like casting pearls before swine. It's useless, and I'm not here to talk to either of them. I'm here for two groups of people. Those who like watching me demolish stupidity, and those creationists of whatever religion who are actually willing to engage with the evidence in good faith, like I was back when I was a creationist. And as I said to you, if I'm speaking with someone who believes in evolution, I'm not going to go into all of these. It is too much for him. I'm just going to say, why do you believe in evolution? You know, start showing me your evidence, your research, and one by one, what he's presenting, I'm going to refute, right? Lantern seems to think that just because he's convinced by his objections to evolution, that that refutes evolution, but that's simply not how it works. In order to refute something, the first step is to know what you're refuting. But fundamentally, most creationists have no clue what evolution actually is or how it works on even the most basic level. This is a simple way to deal with it, okay? Yes, lying is indeed a simple way to deal with evolution, but it's generally ineffective if you come up against people who know enough to detect a lie. So that's what we established now. Now moving on to, to what we call, it's a very important thing that we need to keep in mind now. The rational problems with this idea of... Uh, of uh... Evolution? Evolution, right? Right. Yeah, number two. Let's start with number two. Okay. Number two, it is not falsifiable. Evolution is indeed falsifiable. If you could show a population that doesn't vary in allele frequency, if you could show temporally impossible fossils, if you could demonstrate that large swaths of life could violate the predictions made about them on the basis of universal ancestry, on their own, each of these probably wouldn't falsify all of evolution, but taken together, you could show that in fact evolution is not what we thought it was. But the problem really is that evolution is like the germ theory of disease. We've seen germs, we've watched them cause disease in both the wild and in the lab, so while germ theory is falsifiable, all the things that could have been falsified about it have already been tested, and it wasn't falsified. That's how it is with evolution. All the things that have a chance of falsifying it have already more or less been checked, and evolution came out on top. That's what it means to be a theory. You're no more likely to overturn evolution than the germ theory of disease, because both simply work too well and have already passed virtually every conceivable test you could throw at them. The theory of evolution is not science. Of course it is. Lantern might not like it, but that doesn't make it not science. It's the unifying theory in biology. It has explanatory and predictive power beyond any other proposed theory in biology, and it continually passes every test thrown at it, which is basically every paper published in a biology journal. All right, so it's linked to the first point that I want to make, right? That is pseudoscience. They're, they're linked. So linked, they're basically the same point. One of the key aspects of pseudoscience is unfalsifiable ideas. Of course, I would love to know what observation Lantern might accept as falsifying the idea that Allah did it. The theory of evolution is not science. You cannot falsify the theory of evolution. Why? All right, let's see it. I've already demonstrated two examples in, in, in this tree. Jeez, that's a letdown. Lantern should just change his handle to the Muslim disappointment. Having the understanding of a theory that rivals that of a 10-year-old doesn't actually mean that you've shown that theory to be false. I've demonstrated to you, whenever there's uh, uh, something that comes up that goes against whatever they believe, they change it. Yeah, that's science. That's why the theory of evolution isn't the same as the theory proposed by Darwin. Does Lantern want science to abandon falsified ideas or not? Think back to the story I told about the discovery of Neptune. Urbain Le Verrier used the theory of universal gravitation to predict the locations of Uranus throughout time. But he kept getting it wrong. According to Lantern, he apparently should have just tossed out gravity instead of trying to solve the problem by making adjustments to his model that was still based on gravity. That's almost never how science works. If you have a well-established model and it predicts the wrong outcome, then the first thing you should think of should be unknown variables. Then it should be small modifications to the model. Then only if the model itself cannot accommodate the data at all do you consider tossing it out altogether. They change the goalpost, they come up with a new name, a made-up name, to try to explain whatever happened. Creationists complaining about goalposts being moved. How ironic. Also, all names are made up. Which means that there is nothing in that theory that is falsifiable to begin with. And this is a huge rational problem. That makes it, it's not science to begin with. Which is it? They change ideas because they've been falsified, or evolution is static and unchanging because it's unfalsifiable? You can't have it both ways. Why? Because they rely on the presuppositions of naturalism. Everything has to be explained through natural processes. Science is the study of the working of the natural world in the context of natural causes. If you want to do something that isn't that, that's fine, but it's not science. 
Not everything has to be science. Hell, I like non-science things, but I don't pretend that they're science. They don't accept that there could be anything unnatural, metaphysical, that explains the phenomena that happens. That's weird because Muhammad al-Asiri is a Muslim working at the Department of Basic Science, College of Science and Health Profession, King Saud bin Abdul Aziz University for Health Sciences, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And he wrote a whole article for Nature.com, one of the sources Lantern likes to use, about the compatibility of evolution and Islam. I am damn sure Muhammad al-Asiri believes in the supernatural. Based on that false assumption that they already started with, the theory it cannot be falsified. I already sh 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 showed you that with the circuit fish. He means the cichlid fish, and what he showed was an amazing example of conversion evolution, and that he doesn't understand it. I've already showed you that with the, with the fossil record. How when, when the, we, the Cambrian explosion happened, they change it. The Cambrian biota was known to Darwin. He came up with his ideas fully aware of it. It has not changed the theory of evolution. The Cambrian is simply not a problem for evolution any more than any other period of geologic history. It's just an early adaptive radiation of animals. It's no more mysterious than the radiation at the start of the Triassic, or at the start of the Jurassic, or at the start of the Paleocene. The only difference is that because it's so early in the history of multicellular animal life, the splits occurring then resulted in what we now consider very different animals, putting them into different phyla in many cases. But on the ground, you wouldn't have seen anything unusual about the diversity of life, and it certainly wouldn't have looked like the founding of entirely new body plans. How, how the, the homology, when, when we show them that homology is not due to common ancestors, they change it? Well, he hasn't ever come close to showing that. Instead, he just showed that he didn't know how to tell if something is homologous or analogous, so no change is needed, nor was it made. Conversion evolution goes all the way back to Darwin. If an idea goes back to Darwin, it's not a new one in evolutionary biology. How we show them it's not due to environment, they change it. They change the name. I don't even know what he's talking about with that one. So anything which you will try to put forward against evolution is not falsifiable, which by default disqualifies evolution from being a scientific theory, because evolution is not a scientific theory to begin with. That was an extremely long way to, way to say, I don't like that things that I don't understand don't falsify evolution, because I don't want to believe in that which I cannot understand, and that things that pose problems for my literalist theology scare me. Evolution in its crux, in its understanding, it's not a scientific theory. Why? Because it's pseudoscience. That's like saying coffee isn't a kind of tea because it's coffee. That doesn't answer the question. You have to show why it's not tea. For example, maybe you argue that to be tea, the plant matter you use to infuse the water can't be a seed. That would be a good reason to exclude coffee from a tea category. Saying evolution isn't scientific because it's pseudoscientific borders on an attempted tautology. It is not something that you can see, you cannot observe. I cannot observe species changing from one another. I, it cannot happen. He absolutely can. All he needs to do is get some fruit flies, some containers, and some food for them, and then replicate any of the speciation experiments. It'll most likely take a few years, but he can watch fruit flies speciate in the comfort of his very own home. And they claim because of gradualism. We already defeated this idea of gradualism, but they will still use it as evidence. I don't even know what he's hinting at when he says he's disproved gradualism. The only thing I can think of is that he means that we don't have species by species transitions for most lineages, although we do for some. Oh yeah, okay, uh, because of gradualism, you cannot see. Okay, you claim that there are some species who can evolve quickly. Why are we not seeing them today? <laughs> we are. Tasmanian devils are vastly accelerating the reproductive rate. African elephants are increasingly tuskless. Insects and bacteria routinely develop resistances to the chemical warfare humans use against them. We just went through a whole pandemic that started when a brand new virus swept across the entire population of Homo sapiens. But still, none of these changes are due to some giant leap. Each generation of these organisms was only marginally different from the last. That's what gradualism is. African elephants didn't suddenly turn into some brand new tuskless thing with only a vague resemblance to an elephant. Gradualism is about a lack of giant jumps in a single generation, not about the pace of evolution, as counterintuitive as that may be. So it is pseudoscience because it's not under the scientific method. It's not under experimentation, repeatability, and falsification. I mean, I just mentioned an experiment that he could do for himself. I cannot experiment under a, a species that is changing from one to another. I cannot repeat the experiment, and I cannot falsify the theory, because whatever you come up with, you will claim it is something else. Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. And it's all based on pseudoscience, like I showed you. All of this idea of Homo habilis, Homo, homo erectus, all of that. They have, uh, like, chapters of stories. And hundreds of bones. Don't forget the bones. Oh, the Homo habilis was walking in this part of the region. He made the Homo... All of these fictional stories they have. It's pseudoscience, not science. That's not how science is conducted. Fiction and not true are not synonyms. 
Even if the scientists who described Homo habilis and all those who have worked on it since were lying, that wouldn't make it fiction. Fiction is a literary genre in which the author creates a narrative that is not true with the intention that the readers will understand that the story is not true. A scientist hypothesizing about past events is not doing that, even if he's wrong. And if a scientist is intentionally creating a false reconstruction of the past with the intent to make people believe it, he's also not doing this. For example, the Quran tells the story of a civilization wiped out after being blown off the face of the earth. And that story isn't true. But the author of the Quran seems to want people to believe that it is. That doesn't mean that the story is fictional. I can't say if it's a lie or not, as I have no idea if the author thought it was true or not. But it's not a fiction. You don't find a, a, a tooth and then say that there's this creature existed and he was walking, he was mating, and he was in this region based on finding a tooth. Correct. That's why Nebraska Man was never really well accepted and was shown to not have existed at all, basically the minute anyone bothered to check. That's not science. No, that's exactly what science is. Some guy made a claim, one guy backed him up on the basis of his bias, the rest of the paleontological community checked and found out that the claim was wrong, and then everyone moved on. That's called falsification. It's exactly the thing Lantern complains scientists don't do. That is now using, you can call it philosophy, call it whatever you want. I'll probably call it science. But the, sci the, the, the theory of evolution is not a scientific theory to begin with. Okay, buddy. That's something that we need to look into. And whatever science that they're using is already refuted, right? So this is the first two, two ideas that I'm putting forward. And this is very important. The reason behind the demonstration that we put forward is to make this idea clear in the minds. Not even Roger from Mud Fossil U is as unclear as Lantern. It's hard to even say how Lantern could have been less clear, short of just making buzzing noises instead of speaking. One group of people who are much better at recognizing when someone has been clear are my subscribers. So make sure you check to see if you're subscribed, and if you're not, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you are subscribed, make sure to use the bell icon to turn on notifications so that you're alerted when I have more content. Also, while you're there, why not make sure that you hit the like button? It really helps the channel. If something is unfalsifiable, you cannot ask me to falsify it to begin with. Technically true, but I wouldn't ask Lantern to falsify anything. I'd ask someone who actually understands what he's talking about. That's why I, you have to ask them for the evidences for them claiming it is true to begin with. Because all of the evidences are refuted and, and they're all manipulated. Do you think using evidence as a count noun is something he got from Christian apologists? That use is standard among them. I think what this is teaching me most is that all creationists seem to be parasitic on Christian creationists. Or at least the Muslim and Jewish ones are. I've now covered two Jewish and two Muslim creationists, and they seem to have just gotten all their talking points from Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research. It's just a bit disappointing that it's nothing new. I was really hoping for something original, but I feel like the last time I heard something truly new from creationists was almost a decade ago. At least we're not getting where's the evolution memes Harun Yahya style. That's like the lowest bar in creationism. So if I have a building that is falling apart, you cannot focus on which part of the, of, of the rocks that are prob problematic. The whole building is falling apart. And if there is no evidences for it, it's not science to begin with. I think I can agree there. Until there's evidence, it's not really science yet. That's why I'd say that string theory probably isn't really part of science yet. It doesn't really have any testable predictions that differ from other ideas. Evolution, though, is in a very different situation. That's why whenever you go to one thing, they will move on to a different thing, to a third thing, a fourth thing, right? Actually, no. I would love to be able to stick to a single topic with a creationist. When we can, we actually make headway. Granted, not generally in the direction the creationist would like, but still. In fact, the very concept of constantly moving to a million topics in a discussion is called Gish Gallop, and it's named after Dwayne T. Gish, a famous Christian creationist. It's also why I won't accept the debate when the topic is just evolution. It's too broad to nail the creationist down to actually finishing a discussion about a single topic. Lantern, if you watch this and you want to pick a single topic to discuss, let me know. I would love it. Now, another thing is the idea of randomness. We've already refuted there is no blind, blind natural selection or random mutation. But the idea of randomness itself, randomness doesn't exist. That's a possibility, and it's technically true that many of the things that are treated as random are actually deterministic, but in ways that are so complex that humans can't really predict them. That's how dice are. But then there are things at the quantum level that really do seem to be non-deterministic. Although, who can say for sure? But the thing is that for the purposes of modeling, which is what theories are about, it doesn't really matter if something is truly random in some philosophical sense, or if it's simply unpredictable except in aggregate. It's reasonable to treat such things as random. Mutations are the result of chemistry, and technically they're deterministic, but the complexity of the tiny variations that lead to one or another mutation are not something humans can reasonably keep track of in a population. 
And so they are not predictable at the scale of population genetics, which means that the models we use to predict and explain population genetics treats them as random. So are mutations random? In some ways, no, they're not. But in every way that matters, yes, they are. Are they all equiprobable? No, but that's not the only way to be random. Again, just like with throwing multiple dice, some results are more likely than others, but we still reasonably treat them as random. Randomness doesn't exist in reality. You cannot prove to me that randomness exists. Randomness is basically the lack of our explanation. Yeah, maybe, but so what? Some things are unpredictable in the particulars, and so we treat them as random. I find it extremely unlikely, but maybe one day humans will find a way to actually predict with reliability each and every mutation that will occur in a population and models of evolution will get far more precise for it. Until then, which is a then that will probably never come, the correct thing to do is to treat mutations as stochastic. It doesn't matter if they are actually random in some ultimate sense. Scientific models are just that. They're meant to model reality in a way that simplifies reality, but is still useful to predicting reality. Once again, Lantern fundamentally fails to understand science. If I flip a coin, it's not 50-50%. I just do not know how much pressure I'm putting in. I do, I do not know the gravity. I do not know which side I'm pushing the coin. If I were to know all of these factors, then there is no such thing as randomness. That's true. Coin flips are not actually random, if you know all the variables that affect them. But that's the thing. We don't. That's why even though we know that, it's still how we do things like figure out who takes possession first in American football and other instances where we need to choose randomly between two options. If you can't predict or control the outcome of an event, then it's reasonable to treat it as random even though it's not. Therefore, they cannot, the whole theory is based on randomness. Nope, just the mutation part. And we've refuted already the pillars of randomness, random mutation and all of that. And if idea of randomness itself is wrong, you cannot base your, your theory on something which doesn't make any sense because nothing is random. Yes, you can though, and it's easy to see. Look, here's a chart of the probability of all the results of rolling two 20-sided dice and taking the higher roll. Something you might recognize as rolling with advantage from the D20 tabletop role-playing games. These dice rolls aren't actually random in some ultimate sense, but once you roll the dice enough times, you'll find that empirically the model that assumes that the dice rolls are random will predict your results. Nearly 10% of your rolls will be 20s, and about 1 in 200 will be 1s. It doesn't matter that the model is treating something that's not technically random as if it were. You can't effectively control the outcome of the roll, nor can you predict it reliably, so we treat it as random. And when we do, the model is successful. That's what science is after. All scientific models contain aspects that are not technically true. Electrical theory is full of fictional particles like holes that don't physically exist as objects. But by considering them, we can do things like build transistors and diodes without the math becoming the kind of thing you need a supercomputer for in the first place. We still don't have a reliable idea of exactly how turbulent flow works, but we can still build vent and piping systems that are not 100% turbulence-free, and they still move fluids where they need to be. Everything is happening in a causal chain according to your beliefs if you're a naturalist. Nope. Philosophical naturalism is the rejection of the supernatural and does not require a belief in determinism. Things may well be deterministic or not in a naturalistic framework. Further evolution is not something tied necessarily to philosophical naturalism. Famously, Fred Hoyle hated the idea and variously tried things to debunk it, even coming up with a stupid tornado in a junkyard comparison. So you cannot pick and choose and claim I'm a naturalist when it comes to this bar, but when it comes to this bar, I'm not going to accept naturalism. I'm going to claim that there is this hidden force that is called chance and randomness. Why? Well, first, as I said, you don't actually need things to be random in some true level that goes to the bedrock of reality. You just need them to be uncontrollable and unpredictable to treat them as random. But second, unless randomness is supernatural, it's not incompatible with naturalism. Do you need jinn and angels for things to be random? I don't see why. In fact, I don't see why, say, a jinn should be able to do random stuff if randomness is fundamentally impossible, as Lantern seems to think it is. And you know what? If there is real randomness and it's actually a law intervening in every single quantum event, then okay. That's good for him. And it doesn't matter for the theory of evolution. If al Khabir is the source of mutations, then so be it. So there's no, no such thing as cold randomness. The whole theory is built, built on assumptions, as we said. The tree of life is based on the genes and homology. Yeah, of course it's built on genes and homology, because that's the evidence of common ancestry. And we showed that the genes and homology have nothing, are not evidences for anything. Homology is not evidences for common ancestry. And the genes are not uh, as similar as they claim that they are. So where does this whole idea of tree of life come from? It all falls apart. Well, it might if Lantern had actually done any of those things. But let's remember, 
Linnaeus noticed it first, and he believed in special creation. The reality of the tree of life is so obvious that you can reconstruct it with a high degree of accuracy without even assuming common ancestry or being able to do a single genetic analysis. Abiogenesis, it is an assumption they cannot explain. And it's not part of evolution. Evolution is a theory that explains how populations of living organisms change and diversify over time. Until you have such populations, you are not in a field where evolution is properly in play. Now some aspects of it, such as selection, may still be important, but fundamentally abiogenesis is not an evolutionary process in a strict sense. Further, the theory of evolution works just fine with any origin of life. If life was planted by aliens, created by al-Khaliq, spawned out of the warp, or developed naturally from chemical processes, it still evolved and is evolving today. Where is the start of... I didn't even go into that. I can go into details. I don't want to, right? Where is the start of all of that? Of what? Life? I don't know. I'm not sure we'll ever know. But that's what's great about science. It sees unknowns not as problems, but as opportunities for more work. Where is the start of the... How did carbon start to grow in hands, hand the leg, and what, hands and legs started walking? And, and we've got what we have today. Well, that happened billions of years after the first life form formed on Earth, no matter how they formed. So he's asking the wrong question. And it's a question he already knows is the wrong one if he understood any of this. This is like Matt Powell asking, if we came from African Americans, then why are there still African Americans? You wanted to say something, Brother Sabo, yeah? Can I mute? Because you're muted. Yeah, but uh, y y your flow, man, your flow is good. I don't want to mess around with it. I have quite the opposite opinion. He should have spoken much, much more during this whole thing. Okay, okay. Halas. And, and the, la the last thing I want to I end up with this, is, is the idea of the changes, or, or the one before the last, the idea of the changes in science. The changes are the best part of science. It's what makes science actually useful. Science abandons the ideas that don't work, or changes them if they still mostly work, so that they work better. Right. They would claim that all of these changes, all of these articles that you provided, is evidences for us, because it shows how science is... Uh, is, uh, is, is cha this is the biggest nonsense that they will come up with, right? I mean, most of the articles didn't actually show anything to be very wrong about previous ideas, but yes. Lantern can't, with any consistency, complain about both a lack of falsifiability and that science changes. Science changes in large part specifically because its ideas are falsifiable and sometimes falsified. That's why I left it as the last point. Never accept this garbage from them. This is true if you have already pillars, foundations of the theory that are undisputable. Which at this point we basically do. Or at least no one disputing it has managed to actually make any good points in a very long time. And then you've got branches that sometimes happen that needs explanation that you might explain in an evidential way. That's what science is. Well, yeah, basically, science builds upon itself. That's why no one is really still out there trying to prove electrons exist or that organisms even evolve in the first place. We already did that, and nothing we're doing now seems to be bringing that into question. So we've more or less moved on as a species. Do not make them come and break the whole thing is nonsense. And because science is changing, we're going to change the nonsense every day a bit by bit. And this is science. Yeah, look, I'm sorry that science doesn't work the way that Lantern wants it to. I mean, I'm actually not, because if it did, we'd still be shoving water up our noses to make sure Iblis hasn't been hiding up there, and blaming sleeping in on a shaitan urinating in our ears and drinking camel urine to overcome heat exhaustion. Which, yes, are all things from the Islamic tradition. Do not be fooled by that, Muslims, right? Because this is a very common nonsense that they will come up with. They will come and say, this is science and science is changing, that's why. No, 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 Habibi, it's not that. It is that you've got no evidence to begin with. I don't know how much more evident it can be that Lantern and Sabor are profoundly anti-scientific in their outlook, whether they recognize it or not. I'm just glad that both historically and today, this outlook is not universal among Muslims. Somewhat famously, the science of optics was basically invented by Muslim scholars, and they used experiments and hypothesis testing to do it. Today, there are Muslims in all fields of science, including evolutionary biology. I don't know the degree to which this anti-science bias is prevalent in the Ummah, but it's far from universal, and many Muslims are perfectly happy to accept science, just as are many Christians. You've got no foundation of the theory. You've got nothing that is well established so we can base on it the theory, and then look of explaining certain things to begin with. Just the fact that we can find fossils where we look for them on the basis of predicting where to look by using the theory of evolution refutes this on its own. So never ex accept this nonsense of, the, of what they would call changes of science, right? No, absolutely not right. That attitude will literally get people killed. That's the kind of Luddite thinking that causes things like anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers, and climate change denialists. Those groups get people killed. And not just members of the group, but innocent people. 
Lantern's ideas are an actual threat to the life of potentially millions of people, given that his channel has over 300,000 subscribers, each of whom could go on to do things like spread infectious diseases, advocate for policies that will harm the planet as a whole, and humans in particular, etc. This is why I do this. Just on its own, rejecting evolution will probably not harm anyone. But as you can see with Lantern and Sabor, it's the overall anti-intellectualism and anti-science stance that it engenders that is the problem. Telling people that because science changes, it's unreliable and best rejected causes pain and suffering and death. As a veteran of the United States military, I'm tired of seeing people cause pain and suffering and death, because I was one of them. And I'm sure Lantern isn't helping bomb innocent people in Iraq or Afghanistan like I was, much to my own shame, but he's no less endangering the lives of innocent people. It's just less direct. Pseudoscience can be just as dangerous as a bomb dropped from a plane launched from an aircraft carrier powered by an electrical distribution system I used to help maintain. Mm -hmm. And let's go now to the last thing, inshallah. Okay, the last thing I want to say is, is, is how those people explain what they say. You've got someone like Richard Dawkins who would try to explain abiogenesis by aliens. Ugh, I am so tired of having to defend Dawkins because honestly, he's a piece of shit. But he didn't do this. Instead, when he was asked by Ben Stein if there was any way he could see intelligent design having a part to play in the story of life on Earth, the only thing he could come up with was aliens designing the first life on Earth. But he does not believe that this happened, nor has he ever advocated for it as an explanation for the origin of life on Earth. Sure, the clip from No Intelligence Allowed with him was dishonestly edited, but even in the original clip, it's hard to come to the conclusion that he was actually advocating panspermia as a real explanation. He was clearly humoring his interviewer's question. I really wish creationists would stop lying about him so I can stop defending him. I don't like Dawkins. I don't want to talk about him. Ideally, I could just ignore his existence, except for a few books of his that I like, which do not make up for the books of his that are basically trash, like The God Delusion. Dawkins might be the worst thing to happen to atheism in the last 200 years. Kind of like how Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab was the worst thing to happen to Islam in like the last 300 years, in my humble opinion. I want to I wanna just highlight the psyche of these individuals, right? Why do I want to highlight the psyche of these individuals? Some people will come and say, why, if you've got all of this evidence, why don't you win the Nobel Prize, man? Just go and <laughs> demonstrate all of this and win the Nobel Prize. Good question. If someone could actually overturn a theory as well-founded and long-standing as the theory of evolution, it would be worth a Nobel Prize. Hell, throw in a field medal too. Why not? The reason is those people already believe it and they don't want to believe in anything else. I'm sorry, what? I don't believe evolution is true because I want to. I was dragged to that conclusion kicking and screaming, at least metaphorically. Evolution to them equals no creation. No, it doesn't. Nothing about evolution means that Al-Bari isn't exactly what the name implies. The originator. The source for all things. Now, that's not me saying that he is, just that it's in no way incompatible. And because evolution to them equals no creation, they will fight with everything to try to prove their nonsense. What about all the theist evolutionary biologists who very much believe that there is a divine hand in creating the world? Will they also fight tooth and nail to protect themselves from believing what they already believe? I doubt it. Because they don't want to believe in God. And many of them believe science is against religion. Many of them are from Christian backgrounds. They've been had bad experiences in their religion. And many of them are from Christian backgrounds who have good experiences with their religion and are still members of it. The same is true for Muslims in those fields. Generally, they don't want religion. They want to move away from religion. They already have this assumption. So they would accept aliens. Someone like Richard Dawkins would accept aliens over accepting that there is a creator, an intelligent maker of the universe. Dawkins might, but say Dr. Mary Schweitzer wouldn't. She's a committed Christian and a former creationist who now works in vertebrate paleontology. I already mentioned a Muslim scientist who accepts evolution in this very video. And while just noting that someone is Jewish is not a reliable way to indicate that that person is a theist, I'm sure that of the many, many Jewish scientists out there, plenty of them are indeed theists. And that's true for many of the scientists of other religions too. I'm sure there are Sikhs, Baha'i, Hindus, etc. who are theists and also not science deniers like Lantern. They would not accept that. They would accept things like intelligent matter. This article that I put by science, they try to attribute intelligence, choice to matter. I don't even care to look it up. I've never heard anyone ascribe intelligence to things like mutation or selection except a straw man them like Randy Galuza does. They would attribute intelligence and choice to matter, but they would not <laughs> attribute it to the creator of matter. Why? Two reasons. First, Lantern is just wrong because many scientists are theists. Two, because brains are matter. 
and they seem to produce intelligence, although as we can plainly see, not always. But I also don't care about whatever this is, and yeah, I bothered to look it up. It's about making AI by mimicking the physical architecture of brains. Once again, I doubt that Lantern did more than look at the title of the paper. To be fair, at this point, I've only read the abstract because all I wanted to know was what the topic was, and that's all that was needed for that. Because they're coming from the presupposition of naturalism. Except the ones who aren't. That's why you can never disprove these people, because they will always say to you the only explanation we accept is the natural explanation. They will come from the hidden assumption. They will go to the extent of accepting aliens, accepting uh, matter to be intelligence, cells, microbes, viruses, all of these things are intelligence, and that's how we have mutations, that's how we have the first cell, that's how we have uh, things happening in the universe. They will use anything. I like that Lantern is just making up his own boogeyman. But yes, in science, the only explanations you get to use are naturalistic ones. Because that's what science is, explaining nature in terms of the natural. But scientists as people do not need to restrict themselves to naturalism outside of the realm of science. And many do not. And now the last thing I want to show is this, is this documentary, The Expelled, right? This is about to get meta. I genuinely warn people, anyone who's doubting that there is a specific agenda happening because of evolution in the scientific community that they're pushing away anyone who goes against them anyone who's got this idea that anyone who, who tries to use god or creationism and evolution or, or deny any of these things anyone who've got any doubt that this is not happening watch this this documentary it's available on youtube actually let me open it i'll just watch this is the beginning of it maybe in case you're unaware expelled no intelligence allowed tell the mostly false stories of people who allege that they were fired for advocating for intelligent design and in some cases, just straight up young earth creationism. Virtually every aspect of the film is either deceptive, outright false, or very unlikely to be true. I want to move on from the music. only one skirmish in a much larger war. I agree with Dawkins here. There is an ongoing and concerted attack on science and learning overall from many directions today, and evolution along with much of medicine and even physics is under direct attack by anti-science advocates who would drag us back to the Iron Age if they could. Science simply makes no use of the hypothesis of God. True, it doesn't. Of course, that's neither a rejection of God nor an acceptance of him. Ask yourself, what is intelligent design given us? Nothing. PZ is right. It's profoundly useless at making testable hypotheses or suggesting new areas of study to investigate. Even if it's true, it's been worthless to science. We cannot accept intelligent design as an alternative scientific theory. Notice that they cut away before the guy can actually explain why? It's almost like the editing in this movie is intentionally deceptive. The movie is lying to you. They will never accept that we have a better argument. They just pester us and they waste <laughs> our time. Aw, poor science LARPers want to be taken seriously without needing to actually do the rigorous work of real science. Sorry, buddy, but that's just not how it works. If you want to be taken seriously, you have to actually deal with data, have reproducible work, and get peer-reviewed, just like everyone else. And hey, if you're right, you'll be able to do it. At least someone who agrees with you will. It wasn't all that long ago that the continents were thought to be static throughout the history of the Earth, and people who suggested otherwise were laughed at. But now those people who believe the continents moved have been vindicated, and plate tectonics is the consensus. So much so that it's even been folded into various creationist attempts at a model. I say attempts because they don't actually explain the data and make no useful predictions. So they're not, strictly speaking, models. If yeah. you really want to see if those people are genuine in the research and what they do, you already heard some of their statements, yeah? Watch that. Feel free to watch it, but then maybe ask people what they think of their involvement in it. All the people brought in as atheists were unhappy about the dishonest ways in which they were edited and made to sound like they believed things that they did not. And it seems Lantern fell for it since he seems to think Dawkins actually advocates for panspermia. Look how those people, no matter what, they're not going to accept any alternative explanations. Right? Mm -hmm. And I rest my case. <laughs> you know? Lantern could probably have found a better place than a notoriously dishonest pretend documentary to rest his case. But then this is exactly the level of discourse I've come to expect from this guy. One of the things, Muhammad, which is very interesting about the way that you presented is that there is a lack of trust now from the general public if they were to take what the the information that we have here and process it properly there's a lack of trust with what some of these dominants are saying well the public has pseudoscientific morons like these two yelling nonsense at them all the time so yeah there's no wonder trust in science is a problem because essentially 
there is so much shoehorning. There's so much reverse engineering. There's so much ad hoc rationalization. The fact is, sometimes we just got to get to the, the, the root of the issue. The root of the issue is they've already assumed Darwinism to be true from the onset. Just like all those stupid astrophysicists who assume gravity is real from the onset without ever discussing the possibility that Jibril is actually just pushing planets and stars around. They've just assumed it to be true. Nope, they've assumed it to be true because we've already had the debate about it and evolution won, and it continues to produce results. Until that stops, that presumption isn't going anywhere. Because it's a presumption that long-standing and so far unchallenged science is close enough to the truth to be useful, which it is. That's why when it comes to similarities between the two genomes rather than being honest and saying one genome is bigger than the other i want everyone watching to know that the only reason that Sabor knows that is because the scientists he's saying are hiding it are actually openly saying that it was the case in their papers if they hadn't he wouldn't know because he sure as shit didn't sequence the genomes himself we can't really do a right uh sort of comparison yes we can and Sabor is welcome to try himself all the tools he needs are free and publicly available, the only exception being that it won't be free to get his own personal genome sequences from a human or chimp. He'd need to use the, again, free and public reference genomes done by others. They just make all these assumptions and deletions and substitutions and say, hey, look at the similarity. I hate that Sabor has also bought into Lantern's crazy idea that substitutions are something that researchers do to their samples, rather than a conclusion about the history of a species in question that they reach as a result of the comparison. It's dumb at a level that anyone who did well in high school biology should be able to figure out. Without telling us what that similarity means, because similarity in and of itself doesn't mean anything. It means that humans and chimps nest together more closely than either does with other apes. And it is a prediction of evolution that was made long before we could do genome comparisons like this, that humans would nest with the great apes genetically, including in neutral variation, which is itself a contradiction to separate ancestry. And that's what was found. So it means that evolution successfully predicted this outcome. And it also means that separate ancestry has been falsified in this instance. There is good reason to reject the separate ancestry of humans, chimps, and bonobos. And likewise, mm -hmm. randomness. The evidence, you know, you gave the good example of uh, Dennis Noble, but we have... Noble is not a good example. His ideas have found no purchase for the very good reason that they're just wrong. They don't make sense of the data, and they are in many cases falsified by the data. Sorry, but that's just how it is as of now. Uh, James Shapiro with Natural Genetic Engineering, who's speaking about how most of the mutations are not actually random. They're actually directed by the organism itself. Which, I'll point out, isn't God. And just like with Noble, the data seem not to support this. And many experiments dating as far back as the 1950s say exactly the opposite. And so this idea has found no ground in science as of yet. Of course, even if it did, it would do nothing to cast universal common ancestry into doubt. So I don't see how it would help these two in their quest to keep humans the special boys of the world. Um, so then you have people like Lynn Margulis, you have people like Masatoshi and I. Lynn Margulis is in no way an anti-evolutionist. Her thing is that she thinks that endosymbiosis, the idea of incorporating another organism into oneself as part of a new joint organism, is a dominant force in evolution, probably because she's the one who came up with it. So it's kind of her baby. She's probably wrong about that, because while we do see examples of it, and it is almost certainly the origin of various eukaryotic organelles like chloroplasts and mitochondria, there's no evidence it's anywhere near as ubiquitous as she would like to believe. I don't recognize the other name he mentioned, but given the track record he has so far, I'll just assume it's another fringe biologist whose ideas are, so far, entirely lacking support. So many atheist scientists who are coming out and saying, this is garbage, it doesn't make sense. I have no idea if these people are atheists. It would neither surprise me to learn that they are, or that they are not. Science is not the purview of atheists, and all pretending it is does is exclude religious people who would otherwise be great scientists. I really wish people would stop discouraging young Christians and Muslims from pursuing careers in science just because some fields of science produce results at odds with literalistic theologies in both religions. Then you have atheist academics like Jerry Fodor, who... Um, you know, in his book, What Darwin Got Wrong, he spoke about the, the, the pressure in academia to conform, the pressure not to challenge Darwinism, and he's an atheist. Darwin is not the prophet of science, hence the title of the first video in this series, The Messenger of Science. Many of the things he said are no longer accepted, and this is uncontroversial to say. If you go around telling biologists that reproduction does not proceed from gemules carrying blueprints for body parts being shed and collected in reproductive organs, They'll look at you like you're crazy for even suggesting that's something to be considered. That Darwin got many things wrong is not controversial, news, or in any way considered subversive. 
But if you want to say that things that, as far as science can tell, he got right were actually wrong, well, then you have an uphill battle. One that, as far as I can tell, these two aren't willing to fight. Because rather than actually doing the work of science, they're just sitting around on their computers complaining about how silly the actual experts are while understanding science in no way whatsoever. <clears throat> Likewise, you have Thomas Nagel, another atheist philosopher, who speaks about how uh, Darwinism uh, has created, uh, Darwinism within academia has created a situation where you can't really question it. I wonder if Einsteinism is also in the same place in physics. What about Kelvinism in thermodynamics? I mean, look at all those physicists just assuming Einstein's field equations and the laws of thermodynamics work. I mean, they should have to demonstrate that in every paper before moving on to actually learning new things. Sure, that would make learning new things virtually impossible, but it might satisfy the complaints of two anti-science grifters on the internet no one who doesn't watch Muslim apologetics has ever heard of. And I think the real issue here is whether you look at the data or you look at the scientists themselves, this is not a normal theory. Yes, it is. All theories have their fringe theorists, their deniers, and their kooks. It's just that Sabor doesn't care enough about things like astrophysics to know all the wackadoo ideas about it, like Velikovskyism or Electric Universe. This is not the way that science normally operates. There's something very dark about this theory. Ooh, the spooky dark theory of evolution is here to hide in your nose, piss in your ear, and turn you to drinking alcohol and eating bacon. Watch out, it's gonna get you. And, there's, and, and that particular aspect of it, you only really start to understand when you understand that Darwinism feeds into atheism and atheism feeds into Darwinism. Good for atheism, then. Look, if it's actually true that being honest with the data and going where they lead means atheism, then whatever. I'm not convinced that that's what evolution does, because I know many non-atheists who accept evolution. But if it does, then so what? That's just an argument from consequences. They have this relationship, and that is absolutely key. Evolution is just like any scientific theory in that it removes some aspect of the natural world from requiring the intervention of a divine hand. If that's a problem for you, then you should deal with that. But it's not a good reason to reject science, and it's not an excuse to spread dangerous anti-intellectual sentiments that can, have, and will get people killed. One last thing I just wanted to add is please go back and watch the stream. And when Muhammad's giving his presentation on the various different issues, pay attention and take note. I did. I'm essentially reading them to my audience right now. For example, one of the things he mentioned right at the beginning was about gradualism, right? Yes, I noticed he seemed not to really understand it at all. And why gradualism is so important. According to Darwinism, if things didn't work in numerous, slight, successive modifications, khalas. That's the end of Darwinism. Mostly. There are some rather big changes in cases like whole genome duplications, but then those are usually not big changes for the morphology of the organism, just its reproductive capacity. So it's arguable that it's not a big change in some ways. But yeah, generally speaking, evolution is gradual in the sense of generation to generation change generally being fairly small, even if it's rapid in terms of years. Okay, the rest of this is just them going over things that I've already covered, but Lantern is just summing them up, and then Sabur Ahmed preaching about the fitra and natural theology. I'm not going to subject you to it. I'm just going to call it here. If you like this video, please be sure to hit the like button and tell me what you liked in the comments. If you hated this video, then please hit dislike and tell me what the problem was in the comments. Fair warning though, if you express your problem rudely, I'll probably match that energy. Either way, make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on so that you're always notified when I have more content. Ma salama wa ismi dapper dinosaur. Hey, before you leave, I just want to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Tovend, Phil Havara, Tapioca Weasel, Whispers, Denny5252, Eleron Teller, Horseflesh, Ian Chen, Landon Knoll, Mabdi Babdi, Monkey They Them, Robert Carpenter, Sphincter of Doom, Volus, Eddie McCoy, E to V, and Strawberry Vane. It's because of my channel members and patrons whom you're seeing on screen that this channel can stay afloat. Without you, it would all shut down. If you want to join the team, there's a link to join the channel below this video, and there's a link to join the Patreon in the description. On the Patreon, you can get a 10% discount for pledging annually, and either way, you get early access to virtually all of my scripted videos often three to five months before they come out for the general public. Thanks for watching.